was nonsensical. I'm going to talk now to a man who is never nonsensical. He's the leader of the Social Democratic Party, William Clouston. Hello, William. Hi, Kevin. Thanks uh, for having me on again. Uh, my great pleasure. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about Brexit. Uh, uh, as I said, historic day yesterday. The bill's through. We're leaving tonight. Um, landslide victory for Boris. Something of a triumph for Boris. Uh, I do think sovereignty was at the heart of what we were trying to achieve. Uh, and if the ERG and Nigel Farage say he has achieved sovereignty for Britain, uh, then I think we can take it that he's done it. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, we, we offered, as a party, we offered broad support uh, to the deal. And had we had MPs uh, in Parliament, we certainly would have uh, voted for it. Um, it is, as you say, Kevin, a, a historic uh, day. It's, a, it's actually a historic uh, victory for democracy. And uh, before we go any further, it's worth just reminding ourselves that it, in EU history, it's actually unprecedented because... Um, there have been about six or seven national it's votes. It's their first no, no, no tariff, no quota deal they've made with anyone else ever. It, that's true, but actually I'm just talking more broadly in terms of EU history, in terms of votes against the EU project. Uh, you know, you've got Denmark, Ireland, France, um, you know, all voting against uh, constitutions. And every single occasion previously, Kevin, the vote was either ignored or flipped. So the vote we had in 2016 was the first time ever that a, a vote against the project has been honoured. Oh, yeah. um, and I think that, you know, we've yes. just got to take... Took take our time, but we got there in the end, yes. Yeah, and we, and we, we got there in the end despite, uh, you know, huge resistance from much of our um, uh, civil service and elite class uh, who were against it. But, hey, we did it, and I think we have to be very proud of ourselves, actually, in, as a country and being the first to get it across the line. And, in, you know, the key thing, the key question for us, you know, irrespective of the actual detail of the deal was, you know, could we uh, finally, after the best part of 50 years, remove our executive by vote? And we can. We Previously, we couldn't. Which is uh, good news. So uh, well, I'm trying to be a bit positive today because we've got a new year dawning and uh, God knows we've got lots of problems, uh, but uh, the Brexit situation seems to be to be a reason uh, for optimism. Uh, tell us what you think this year ahead will bring us in terms of our relationship as a nation, and not only with Europe, but with the rest of the world, uh, thinking uh, prominently, of course, about uh, the kind of deal we might be able to make with America. Yeah, I mean, well, the the, the deal um, does preserve, I mean, it's a zero uh, quota, zero uh, tariff deal. So what the deal does secure in the short term is flows of trade between ourselves and the EU. Um, you know, I, I suppose in the short term, certainly that's a very good thing. Uh, we as a party were the only party that actually uh, were a little bit sceptical of that. Our preferred option was a, a WTO solution which would have implied a little bit of trade friction. And the reason we argued for that was that we do have, you know, the EU is actually our, our most problematic trading partner in that we've got a, a huge uh, goods trade uh, deficit with them. And we need to address that. We can't just leave that standing. If you leave that standing year after year, you, year after year, you get a little bit poorer. So um, in the short term, certainly the economic prospects are, 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 are certainly brighter for the deal being there. I, I wouldn't doubt that. Uh, there was one uh, study by a think tank a couple of days ago that said that within uh, 30 years, I think it was, uh, that Britain would be uh, a 35% bigger economy than France. Now, what I'm getting at, William, is that uh, if we prosper... Uh, as I think we might, if we really prosper, as this study suggested, uh, what future does that bring to the EU? Won't the countries of the EU, particularly the prevaricating ones, you know, Italy, Spain, some of the Eastern Bloc, Hungary, the ones that aren't that thrilled with their membership of the EU, do you think other nations would look at our success and say, hey, we want a bit of that? Yeah, I, I, I have no doubt we'll prosper. I think we will anyway. And I think that we, we you know, people that used to claim that we our own only source of prosperity was being a member of the EU, that, that was nonsense in any case. So I'm, I'm actually broadly optimistic about our 
prospects in the world. I think there's some reorientation we need to make. We need to uh, build in greater resilience. We need to reindustrialize and reshore. We need to and, and, and we need to re, we need to spread our food imports as well to be less reliant on the EU. But yeah, looking at the EU itself, I see um, it'll be in it'll remain in permanent crisis. I mean, you've, the EU, their uh, flagship economic project, the euro, is a massive failure. Um, it builds in huge surpluses for Germany because it artificially depresses uh, the currency they're using, and that's at everyone else's cost. So every single year. The French and the Italians, the Portuguese and the Spanish and the periphery effectively deindustrialize. And you know, you've got very, very high unemployment rates and massive youth unemployment rates. So I'm afraid the prospects for the EU are, are not brilliant. And the think tank that uh, produced the figures on what Britain will be in 20 or 30 years' time is quite right. We're likely to have a higher population, uh, much bigger GDP, and uh, certainly be a, a, a highly successful economy. As to whether any of the EU embedded member states can actually get out. I'm not sure. I think the EU's project will limp on uh, as a sort of dysfunctional, low growth backwater um, because they're trapped uh, and you've got to have sympathy for them. But if you ask Kevin, if you asked yourself, could the Italians realistically uh, get themselves out of this and reindustrialize? That's a huge task because the actual institutions I and mean, one of the consequences of being in the EU is that your national institutions are diminished. Uh, they don't have a currency, they'd have to build that. Uh, and they, a lot of the structures are, are, are basically subcontracted to, to Brussels. So it's very, very difficult for them. And I, I, I do sympathize, but from, from our own point of view, I think we can you know, go out and look at the world and, and, and prosper and do very well. Uh, in the near future, William, I must get to grips with you uh, about what the Social Democratic Party is all about. But uh, we've got a tight schedule today, so that will have to be put off for another time. Uh, so finally, I'd like to sort of indulge in a bit of triumphalism, if you don't mind. Uh, basically, the Brussels hardliners, Barnier included, uh, and Junkers, remember him, they wanted, and uh, Donald Tusk, they wanted to punish Britain for leaving the EU. They wanted to make sure that uh, we left the EU uh, in a depressed state, unable to be as, uh, as successful as we have been in the past, and to show to the world, if you leave the EU, it's not a good thing to do. Well, uh, they didn't manage to do that. They have not punished us. We've got no quotas, no tariffs. We'll be able to trade with the world on our own terms. We've got sovereignty. We're not uh, bound by the rules of the European Court of Justice. We've got our independence. They have not punished us. We beat them, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, against all the odds, you know, and you mentioned uh, Theresa May earlier, um, had had the... What was that about, though, by the way? Sorry to interrupt. What was that about when she stood up yesterday and said, my deal was better than Boris's? And she it's lost bizarre. her mind. It has a <laughs> Thomas Kuhnian quality of not realising reality there. You know, you, people people hang on to their views of the world despite the evidence. But, you know, I, I, if we didn't get a few key... And you have to hand some of the credit to Boris Johnson for walking out on yeah. that deal. Yeah. And you yeah. also have to you know, give credit to Nigel Farage and his Brexit party for piling pressure on mm. uh, politically. And, and the nice thing about it, Kevin, was that this roadblock was, was unblocked by democracy. It was unblocked by a general election. Mm. Yes, we had to effectively ask for the third time for it to be honored. But it, it, as I say, it's historically unprecedented. And it does mean that we're a little bit different mm. from the other nations. And I'm very proud of that. Yeah, uh, the, the result of the general election, which in effect was a second referendum on leaving Europe, proved uh, what I've always maintained is uh, if they did have that people's vote that they wanted, the second referendum, uh, they'd have lost. Uh, we would have lo we'd have left uh, it, Europe anyway. Uh, and I still think that's the situation. I still think the majority of people in this country uh, want to leave Europe. And now we are doing it at long last. So uh, rejoice. Uh, William, let's talk again soon. Thank you so much for your time. William Clouston there, uh, the leader of the Social Democratic Party. And in the near future, uh, I'm going to ask him exactly what uh, that party is all about. It's a very interesting new political movement. Uh, and in my view, they talk a lot of sense. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Talk Radio.